notice that you can only enter the system with one device at a time. Now, yes, first of all, I'm going to invite Oscar Robles, who will conduct the test. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Welcome. Welcome to this assembly, ordinary assembly of Lacanic. We're going to have a test to ensure that everybody who's ready to vote, to ensure that everybody who's ready to vote, let's make sure that they can connect. So please, could you put the first vote, please? This is a test. Can you activate it? Can you help me? So the first motion, if you had to choose between li liquor or coffee in the afternoon breaks, what would you rather have, tequila, mezcal, or uh, spirits? Let's see what people prefer. Well, apparently this week you've learned something. So, as you may see, the screen in the right, you see who's voting what. It's all transparent, all the voting is open. <coughs> then you can check that your vote, if your vote was uh, uh, registered properly. So this is now we want to know whether uh, everybody is ready. Maybe if you have questions. First, trying to check whether there's anything with configuration. First, so we have some support devices to make it easier for you to have access. We're going to give you some time, so do not uh, worry. Son aproximadamente 591 votos presentes. So we have about 400 uh, and uh, well, we we when here we're not speaking of people but uh, organizations because remember that there are differential uh, votes. Uh, some organizations have from 1 to 11 votes, depending on the number of resources. So it's 496. That's the total amount. Vamos alrededor de 530 votos. 530 votos. I hope these are members with multiple votes, but because if it's 60 with difficulties, that would be a, a bit long.
40 votos por conseguir. 40 votos to get to conclude the test. Does anybody else need support? Aside from Marcelo, could you raise your hands? Because maybe we can uh, give you support. In addition to you, Marcelo? Does anybody need support? I don't see any hands up. There you are. And uh, Marcela voted for spirits. Estamos. Are we there? Apparently, nobody else needs any assistance, so we are ready. If 
Thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Now we are going to start with the, the ordinary assembly, and that is why I thank, I welcome Alejandro Guzman of LACNIC, who will take the floor. At uh, 4 p.m., 27 minutes of the 10th of May, 2023, we opened the second call of uh, the uh, Members' Assembly of the Registry of LACNIC, called by the Board on the 10th of May, 2023, and having been communicated with a circular to members 30 days in advance on April the 5th, 1993. As uh, comes from uh, the registry, there are 195 members with 634 votes. The board has decided to modify character of item three of the order of day, update of the social uh, fees, deciding not to vote that uh, item, but still we will present to the Assembly the information related to this topic. This decision is based on the fact that we decide not uh, to uh, accelerate uh, such a decision, to give time to all members to properly assess this adjustment and uh, to decide based on exact and clear information. As a consequence, verify the quorum and then so we start uh, discussing the first uh, point in the agenda, appointment of the President and Secretary of the Assembly. As uh, both the President and myself and the Secretary, Esteban Lescano, who's the uh, Secretary of the Board, and as stated in Article 16 of the social statutes that were reformed uh, the previous year, they should uh, act as President and Secretary of the Assembly. With that prejudice of the above, we inform the Assembly that the role of the Secretariat will be acted by the legal advisor, Eduardo Jiménez de Arechaga, who has been doing this since uh, the Assemblies in 2004. We'll now consider the second point in the order of the day, considering and approving the statement, the general statement inventory uh, expenditures and resources report uh, of externals and the fiscal committee as of uh, December 31st, 2022. Prior to, to the consideration by the board, Oscar Robles, the CEO, and uh, Diego Mena, the manager of finances and the members of the electoral and the fiscal committees, we uh, will speak, uh, giving a summary of uh, our activities and describing the documents that are to be described, uh, debated by um, the Assembly. So let's start with the first that has to do with the board. So I'm going to do it from the rostrum. If you attended the Assembly two years ago, you will recall that this presentation was not part of the normal assembly. What the director did was not reported during the annual meeting. Let me first explain why we decided to include this as part of the program of the assembly. It turns out that in different conversations with different members of the community in the past, we realized that there was no clear knowledge as to what the board does. And there was a lot of lack of information regarding the roles of the board of directors. Many people came up to us and asked if they, we could assist them, for example, in assigning IPs because they were in a waiting list. Others came up to us asking us if we didn't take steps to implement more fiber optics in the Latin American Caribbean region. So those are the types of things that have nothing to do with the role of LACNIC's board of directors. So what we thought 
was why don't we explain more of what we do and use the assembly for this purpose. That is why there is meta-knowledge on the role of the board and the activities we carried out. A further option is that different people wish to collaborate more in the community and think that the board is the adequate place to do so and that what they wish to do is in fact more aligned with other spaces of the community and maybe not precisely the board because the board of directors does things that are different from what you wish to achieve. So you want to be certain that you are all aware of the activities we carried out and if someone wishes to provide further support and you see that this coincides with the way you wish to collaborate with the community and what the board does, then you can commit yourself when you are nominated and otherwise which are the positions in the community that are more aligned with your personal objectives as a community and the organization. So in this presentation, let us explain the composition of the board. First, then we'll look at the work we do as a board, the operations and characteristics. Uh, the work we did in 2022, what are the documents and guidelines we worked on and implemented last year, what were the most relevant resolutions as well as other aspects in which the board of director was involved last year. Let me start then telling you <coughs> about the composition of LACNIC's board this year. Can we have the next slide, please? Muy bien. Um, So the board of Lactic's board of directors is composed of seven members and we come from different countries. Some of you know all the directors, but others not so much. So it's a good opportunity to introduce them. Let's start from right to left. We have Javier Salazar from Mexico. He was a member of the board for many years and his mandate, his term ends in 2025. He's also part of the Committee of Risk and Information Security of the board. We have Carmen Denis, who is a vocal from Mexico. She joined the board three, a few years ago and also collaborates with the Risks Committee and Information Security. She's also the second secretary of the board. We have Esteban Lescano from Argentina. He currently is a secretary of the board of directors and his term ends in 2024. We have Wartner Meyer, who is not with us today because he is sick and recovering at home. He is a deputy treasurer from Brazil. His term ends in December 2025. We have Gabriel Adonailo from Argentina, who is a treasurer. And he's also a member of the Finance Committee together with Wartner Maya. We have Evandro Varonil, who is a deputy secretary and is also part of the Information Security and Risk Committee. And myself from Colombia, I'm the president and my term ends next year. And I've been a member of the board for quite a number of mandates. So these are the members of the board. In addition to Oscar Robles, who is the executive director and he participates in the board meetings with a vote, vote but with not a vote. So Oscar together with other members of the staff participate in the meetings we have. Now let us explain the role of the board. I would like to start with something, namely stating that the directors are here to ensure that the organization meets the objectives with which is such created. The social objective has seven important points that we have to comply with. As directors, we are forced, or we are committed rather, to see that these seven points of the social objective are met. If we don't ensure that these seven points are met, 
then we would not be complying with our role. We have to ensure that these objectives are met and at the same time that the organization that supports these points is an efficient organization that does adequate use of the resources and that this is sustainable over time. So that would be a good summary of the purpose of the board. The board of directors or the authority of the board of directors is given to it by the members because ultimately they are the ones who choose the members of the board who are constantly thinking how we can ensure that we meet the social objective of the organization. Now to meet the social objective, which include managing IPs to represent the standpoints of the interest from the region, to provide IP address registry services and to collaborate in the growth of internet in the region and promote educational and technical opportunities as well as the development of policies like the forum we had a while ago. All these are roles that the board of director has. No, to meet all these roles, we have actions that have different terms. There are long-term actions, for example, all those that have to do with the strategic plan. The strategic plan is created for a three to five year period. So this is a vision of what we wish to achieve over a relatively longer period of time. So not only to have a view of the present, but what the organization is today and what it should be in the coming years. So that is the strategic plan. It's the long-term action. Then we have the medium-term actions that have to do with things such as the review and annual approval of the budget, of the operational plan, and the regulations. We call these medium-term actions because normally these are for a one-year period. For example, some modifications of documents take a bit longer and not done on such a regular basis. But this has to do with the role we have as a board of directors. And then we have the short-term actions when we constantly see how the plan is being implemented, how the budget is being implemented. This is the operational plan. We are not, um, we don't design it, but we monitor if that is carried out and if it is carried out during the year and is finally approved. And sometimes we have uh, uh, requests or options that ha things have to, have to be improved. For example, when the war broke out in Russia, this had an impact on the stock exchange throughout the world, and some of uh, Lachnik's reserves were uh, invested, financial investors. So we see how we can protect the investments we made when the pandemic came. We then considered how we would be responding to the requirements of the payroll and how, what we're going to do with the General Assembly because we couldn't meet during the pandemic. So these decisions had to be made on what about the legal advice. So whenever there are unexpected situations, we meet to find solutions based ourselves on the guidelines of the organization, on the legal requirements, and also with the support of experts. Now, considering long-term issues, why is it so important to review the long-term situations? Because this is not a static organization and it changes over time. This is an organization that is more than 20 years old, so we are no longer in the initial stages of growth. What was important 10 years ago might not be so important today, or maybe things that were important and that had to be achieved have already been achieved, and now we have to maintain these things. That is why plans have to change and also in accordance with the reality. Ten years ago, we had IPv4 addresses to assign. Now, income came and members came just to ask us for resources, but now the situation might be different compared to what we had a few years ago. That is why we have to review what we have to do for that year and for the coming years so that the organization continues meeting its social objectives and to maintain the standards we have or even exceeding these. Right now, we are at a stage of operational excellence. and. 
we sometimes find it even difficult to see what we can improve yet further. For example, about the personnel. So we look at the past years. How many years have you been, in, been at the place best place to work regarding employee satisfaction. It's very difficult to even go beyond that. Customer satisfaction, we check that every now and again, and that is very high. So everything is at a level of excellence, but maintaining that is sometimes even more difficult than reaching that stage. So now we have to maintain those levels of excellence, and that is part of our objective as a board. So the strategic plan that we uh, now, ha now have was defined last year and reaches out until 2025. That is the period for this plan. Now, for this strategic plan, we have several pillars on which all our actions are based. We have a special mission is to build a regional community for a better global internet. And with that aim, we have to meet with all the principles we have. The principles include what we, how we value people, we seek excellence, we work as a team, and we are strongly committed. Like I mentioned earlier, there are many issues related to the institutional life that support this strategy. So the operational plans we implement have to be aligned with the strategic plan, the long-term strategic plan. Then we have, this slide is a bit busy, but basically we have the strategic plan and the definition of the guidelines for the government. These define the limits within which we can move the objectives. We have strategic processes within the organization, and everything we do in the organization is aligned with the strategic guidelines. This is there to support the different services we offer. We also have the support. As a board, we don't be get involved in the implementation of all these things, but we focus on having the necessary guidelines in order to meet all these objectives. Now, how do we communicate in the board? We have a mailing list with which we constantly communicate. We have um, telephone calls. Every year we have about seven meetings. Uh, these last about two hours, and very often this takes more than two hours because there are many things that we have to discuss. And then we have in-person meetings. We have four in-person meetings every year, which have a duration of one to three days. And how can you meet together for one to three days in the same room? But we really discuss very many topics and that many decisions have to be made. For instance, at this meeting, it took uh, the entire uh, Sunday and then the morning of Saturday uh, of Monday just for the board meeting. And sometimes we meet for two or three days and at the end of the year to check everything that was done that year and to go through everything that will be done next year. That takes time. And we also take part of internal committees. There are some. Uh, uh, discussions that don't require the entire board to be there, sometimes drafting documents. So implying the entire board will will uh, imply even longer. And so we have several committees, and each committee will be in charge of a topic, and usually there are from two to three directors being part of that committee together with other members of the staff. So we have investment and finances, uh, risk and uh, security. Uh, the information, and then we we have uh, the members of the board that are part of uh, the years, and sometimes well it depends on the year. How do we distribute time? Here we have the key topics for the board. M much of the time has to do with the organization of LACNIC, precisely as an organization. 23% of the time is devoted to that. Um, checking uh, financial issues, um, about 18%. And to review operations, 19%. Topics that have to do with the community, 15%. Uh, uh, 
and uh, procedures, community, uh, internal organization, statutes, uh, 11 percent, and operations. So this is quite difficult, uh, different from what you think we spend our time in because the technical issues are done by other parts of the community. Policies is analyzed at the meetings to approve it, but it is not part of the time of the board and things like that. So that gives you an idea of what the board does at its meetings and the topics that we have to make decisions about. So let's talk about what the board does not do. We, we already saw something in the previous meeting. So we do not define the policy resources. The policies are done by the community through the public policy forum. Today we had the forum and the community could participate. What does the board do? Well, we ratify. And what is that? Basically, when a policy is approved by the community and it reaches LACNIC for implementation, we have a chance to um, check. And if what was approved goes against LACNIC, as an organization, it's impossible to implement or causes damage to the, the association because of other things that are not appropriate, then the board may reject that policy and send it back to find another solution. It's very strange for that to happen. Or also, we ensure that the policy that we reach to implement met all the uh, steps uh, that are needed. So the idea is so uh, if a policy uh, was done without complying with the process, then you give an opportunity for the community to participate in its discussion and approval. What else do we do to have the knowledge to ratify a, a policy? We read the proposals, we follow the policy list, we monitor what is being said, uh, we measure the impact analysis of the staff. Sometimes if we notice something that is not in the impact analysis that is relevant, we can communicate and we attend the public forum to see what's happening with the process. And we propose initiatives to improve the development of policies, things that may be useful. We don't get in, in, um, engaged in the policy itself, but in the process so that it will be better. Uh, let me give you an example. Some years ago, we were worried to see how can we ensure that there is enough participation for the chairs so that we may guarantee that the chairs may be people with the capacity to uh, direct a, a policy forum because that's difficult. So they decided to hold trainings so to train the people who wanted to be moderators. And thanks to that, we've had very good chairs, as you may have seen. Just to give you an example of things done by the board to support the policy development process. So, who else? What else does the board not do? We do not define to the organizations that receive resources of the internet, so we are asked about that. We are not the ones who decide who receives and who doesn't. So there's, there are policies stating who decides, and there are requirements, and the staff applies the policies, so the board has absolutely nothing to do with those decisions. And what we do do is that basically we check that the staff is complying with the process and LACNIC organization also verifies that the regional registries, Mexico and Brazil, we conduct audits so they may comply with uh, the processes. And the board always learns about the audits uh, to the regional boards. We do not conduct financial audits, but we review the quarterly and annual uh, financial statements and we work with the fiscal committee and the external auditors looking for improvement possibilities and working with the staff to seek how to implement it. So we are not control entities. Those are the internal auditor, the auditors and the fiscal committee. They check that everything is financial perfectly well and that the internal procedures are being com uh, complied and they tell us if something is not being done well and we need to see what's going to do to fix what's not working. 
now for the peace of mind of the members. In recent years, increasingly, we find in the reports we find almost nothing we need to, to do because the staff follows it quite adequately. What else does the board not do? We do not adopt the operational decisions in the organization. We establish the general directives, the strategic ones, but not the fine details of the pro for each project. So the staff follows the guidelines, but we do monitor the the implementation regularly. Nor do we adopt decisions on technical topics. Uh, however, we evaluate the risks of technical operations, for, in, for instance, the risk of security of information. And uh, the approach is more ex executive, the implementation of the technological risk or digital security are of concern. Nor do we work to get funds to deploy networks in the region because this is not part of the social uh, purpose of the organization. We monitor the promotion um, programs such as FRIDA and uh, sometimes the funds are assigned for the deployment of networks, but it's not the key objective of a clinic to do that. Sometimes Frida assigns it when the project has merits, and but we don't value investment volumes that will be that need uh, um, women, so it has not to do with the access. We do not handle the monetary resources of uh, the organization. We check uh, the annual budget statement. We see to it that uh, the use of the resources are adequate and efficient, and the finance committee uh, guides the staff in the administration of reserves. So we need to maintain uh, reserves operational in case something happens, and we have guidelines as to how the reserves are being done. What's the optimal uh, level that is established between the board and the finance committee? So after seeing what we do and what we do not do, let me show you some things that we did last year. As to new uh, uh, documents uh, created, one is the policy for the transfer of spending. There were some uh, policy of transfer of uh, spending budget. in. If a project was decided to be done in June, but then uh, they switched uh, the idea because then the staff had to wait until the board met to correct that. So that slowed down the. Um, uh, so now you can move money within certain limits to give a greater efficiency and um, speed to the um, organization. And the agreement of confidentiality of the ethics committee that has worked for some time. The, the members of the ethics committee need to be from the laboratory from uh, the, the board or people in the community. They had to maintain uh, confidentiality. This document was approved last year, and a very important thing that is in the past we had only had a risk committee. And uh, with ev every time the uh, security of information is more important. So we worked on a policy of security of information for non disclosure closing a closement agreement. One was the commitment of the board of LACNIC, and if what happens if one member of the board is non-compliant? So far, we have all done our job. What hap happens in the future? Somebody new does not meet the standards. There should be mechanisms to uh, replace that member of the board that is not uh, uh, abiding by the commitments. Then we have the agreements, uh, confidentiality agreements, and non disclosure agreements uh, of the commissions, the reserve policy, the risk management policy, 
the uh, travels of the board uh, policy committees and members of a ASO AC and the definition and operations of the board committee how what are the guidances that need to be applied for that purpose what are some of the most important uh, uh, resolutions, some are repeated, some are new, but for instance, January, that's a month we get together, we decide the positions and, and we define who will represent the board in different committees or representation. We, always, we also define the calendar for the entire year and the annual electoral uh, timetable, both statutes for and for the community, because there's a, a lot of uh, things that you have to uh, do, you have to plan what works well, and it is important and you have to review it and approve it, and in January, that's what we do. In February, we approve the objectives of the CEO, and in December, we develop uh, the operational plan and it's approved and the budget and by February we define the responsibilities of the executive uh, um, director for the operational plan and all the rest of the objectives that the director must uh, meet. In March we call for the extraordinary uh, assembly. This year we uh, called for the assembly in March and we read uh, the annual assembly this is this one was corresponds to 2022 in november the these we monitor the recommendations for fiscal controls and uh, and in december the long, longest in december we spent three days in montevideo reviewing everything that happened the previous year if uh, the revenues uh, were met, uh, if the spending was done uh, appropriately, what are the risks that really turned out to be and which not. So a lot of things are checked at the end of the year and we also approve the operation part for next year and the budget for next year. So those are the most important things. Other resolutions, I won't get into the details. I don't want to uh, uh, worry you with so many resources, but there are many documents that we need to go through. And they were also done in uh, the reviews of the previous year. Here, for instance, we have when a policy is done in the forum and it comes for ratification, in the appropriate meeting, we check all the approval and we ratify it. And we debate whether there are any risks for LACNIC implementing some policy and we return it. We may return the case. And it's, ha it's, it's happened almost nowhere. In only one case did we uh, give it back and in another one we didn't approve it after the procedure. And here we have other topics debated at the previous board. Uh, just there are some that are interesting. It has to do with the, the uh, reports to um, n n NIRs. Well, th there are some that are not uh, audited by LACNIC, but by Mexico um, and Brazil, the other NICs that follow the same rules of the rest of the community. So LACNIC has a responsibility to make sure that they are doing it properly. So that is why we audit them, and especially in the implementation of policy. Last year, we revised the two national registries. Now we're also checking the waiting list. Those who asked for IPv4 resources in the previous months know that there is a waiting list of many years. So we do a constant follow-up on the status to see what we can do in order to improve the situation or to communicate that operators operate IPv6 because it will take longer to obtain IPv4 resources. And then we do follow up to the quality control and the survey of the services regarding the quality audit. We check whether we are following the procedures correctly and the services survey tells us from the members and for the clients, we can say, if 
from their standpoint, we're meeting their expectations. We check what is being met and what not. And after that, the staff prepares a plan as to how to respond to those things where they didn't do so well. And the board does follow up. The board then, when they have the most important event, a meeting, they communicate these things through the mailing list and through the website. Maybe some of you have not seen these things, but if you wish to look at the reports, we share this transparently in the website and explain what we did during each of the activities, the summary of the activities. So thank you very much. This was the report of the Board of Directors. Now we will go on to the next report, which is Oscar reports as an executive director. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Let us now So, as is the case usually, the presentation on the summary of the activities on the previous year is from the four standpoint of the strategic planning, namely the focus of the information towards of the associated services and the services to the extended community. As you are aware, we've had that double responsibility with our members who are the ones who receive our service, but also with this community that is present at our events. So we start then with information on the number of members. This year we had an increase in the number of members of about 600 in the course of the year, and we have about 12,400 12,438 by the end of 2022. So we continue having an increase in the number of members, but this is getting a bit lower in percentage. Now, one of the most relevant events was the exhaustion of IPv4, which occurred on August 19, 2020. The mechanism that was defined by the community to continue providing IPv4 addresses and those that we recovered through the revocation process, the mechanism defined by the community is to have a waiting list, or rather we enabled a waiting list to continue assigning resources in the way that was defined by the community. The maximum assignment is a slash 22, but we can also assign a slash 24. But the problem is that the wait number of the waiting days increases, and those who register today will receive the resources after 2027. Those who receive resources today or on December 31st, 2022 had waited for two years almost until they received those resources. And those who apply today will have to wait for five years. So in practical terms, there are no IPv4 resources. So if you apply, if you register in the waiting list, your expectations is, well, you eventually might get these. But as you can see, this list is endless. Now, in some occasions, as was the case last year, following a revocation process of 14 applications of someone from Chile, we researched the cause uh, and the application, and we saw that information was not correct. We had to revoke those resources, and that is why this curve has this shape. So there was a slight drop in the number of days in the waiting list, but this is not at all frequent. Now regarding transfers, which is another way to obtain resources, whether from other members within the region, namely the 
and the red part of the bars. or also transfers from other regions. So what you can see here is that the number of requests for transfers increases, but we also have a large number of resources that are transferred within and outside the region. The countries that receive the largest number are Colombia, Aruba, and Mexico. As you can see here on the graph on the right. And the, now, the other countries are transfers between companies of the same group. So these are not considered as relevant because basically we understand that this is an internal group of that organization. Part of the services that we have to provide has to do with the implementation of policies defined by the community. The policies are the rules we have, and one of the rules that was defined a couple of years ago is the validation of a contact of abuse. This policy sought to give a response that would not be made by robots or that had certain mechanisms to determine that this was a, an individual that was behind. So we implemented this. This is a process that is an iterative process. Through diverse notifications, we notify the contacts. And if we are going to recover resources based on these, this policy, we want to be sure that the organization is not using these resources and is not a contact of abuse. So we have followed several stages in order to really verify the correct configuration of that contact. Today, only 20 enterprises haven't concluded this process. This was as at December last year, but today this must have been updated and they will be in the process of revoking this in the coming weeks or maybe even days. But these are only a limited number of resources. Nevertheless, this has been a successful implementation of the policy, but nevertheless, this requires a lot of attention. As you can see, this iteration began in May 2021, and we'll be concluding it now. So it is a period of two years of notifications, reviews, and notifications. And finally, it is an individual telef telephone contact where the people responsible for the network of services do this telephone verification by telephone. <coughs> and a very important element of our services is the satisfaction survey of our members. So it's not only about doing things, but doing this adequately. For some years now, we organize a survey every two years, and we ask the members the level of satisfaction with our services. LACNIC asks its direct members, the NIRS, Mexico and near Brazil, do this with the same survey, of course, translated into Portuguese in the case of Brazil, but this is the same survey in order to obtain a similar result. In the case of LACNIC, the results are above 90%, so from our standpoint, these are values of excellence, and it's very difficult to identify areas which does not meet the expectations for satisfaction of the members. And we have even analyzed the responses in those of the highest level of satisfaction. And despite the pandemic and despite the difficulties, we have managed to maintain very positive results. In the case of Nick Mexico and of Nick Brazil, as I was saying, they also carry out this survey. In the case of Nick Mexico, we apply this together with the others, and we can see the results obtained. In the case of Mexico, I can tell you that they have results of almost 98%, which is also very positive. 
at the same time, as I was saying, we organize the one I mentioned earlier is carried out every two years. But we have an alternative mechanism to measure and to have a more immediate response time. Whenever you do some relevant action in a system, for example, you pay and you receive resources, or there is a change to the resources in Milaknik, you receive a brief poll where you rate your level of satisfaction. And we have identified a high level of consistency among the quarterly responses regarding the satisfaction poll. Now, this allows us to have a timely measurement option and a sort of early warning system in the event of having any insatisfaction among our members without having to wait for two years where we apply the other poll. A further important fact among our activities is the way we approach our members. We are not only satisfied with the meetings we have uh, such as these. So for some years now, we have established a outreach program where we go to cities. We have multiple contacts, whether individual contacts, when this is justified. We explain the services or the benefits they have as members. We explain the services that we offer and the training activities we have and obviously the rights they have as members. We also, in some cases, convene a group of members when we have a relevant number in that city. At the same time, we attend their own meetings this year. We participated in in-person meetings in Mexico, in Cuba, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua. These were virtual events, and we contacted different members. In the case of Chile, we had an event organized by the Traffic Exchange Point, and we contacted 30 members there. Here we had planned a specific meeting in the case of Chile. This was not an event. But we did have an event in Colombia where we had a booth and we had a large number of participants who came with questions, transfers, concerns as to how to obtain resources and even operational questions this year prior to this event. There was a whiz next and we had a booth and had the chance of listening to a large number of members who had similar questions. I will now, I haven't finished with my summary, but one of the important elements of our services is related to the extended community, and this involves the electoral processes. Part of the institutional life has to do with the electoral processes. One of these processes as I said, are the electoral processes. So I'm going to ask this commission to please come up to the rostrum and to give us a summary of the activities carried out last year. I'm going to ask Cristobal Chapital from Mexico, Nancy Cordova from Peru, Marcelo Corradini from Brazil, Karin Cofre cannot be with us for health reasons and wish him a fast recovery and Maria Jose Franco from Paraguay to please come up. Welcome. Good afternoon. First of all, 
We wanted to welcome you to, Lac to LACNIC 39, all the members of the LACNIC community that uh, participate at this event at present. We are here as an electoral committee. There is five of us. We have Cristobal Chapital from Mexico. I'm Nancy Julia Cordova, plus Marcelo Urriti from Brazil, Carolina Cofre, who's not here because of health uh, problems in Chile, and Maria Jose Franco from Paraguay. As we mentioned earlier, as Electoral Committee, one of our missions is to oversee and certify the election processes. We speak of elections when they are bylaws and the community. We also manifest and control the documentation presented by the candidates. Another action um, is uh, to um, uh, appeal uh, in case of incompatibilities. That is that we have the power to eliminate or to restrict uh, the uh, nomination of a candidate that has been nominated. We can reject that person. And the, and we also account the val the ballots and validate the results and we proclaim the winner. Among the processes in uh, 2022, we have the processes in the fiscal committee. We had three candidates to cover a vacancy. In this case, the person elect was. Aristotle Cantas from 2022 to 2025. He's from Brazil. And for this, there were 1,296 organizations. That is 11% of the community. From then on, the, the Electoral Committee had another election with nine uh, candidates to cover one position. 1,199 organizations, that is 10 percent, voted, and he, they selected Maria Jose Franco from 2022 to 2025 from Paraguay. Another process that we participated in 2022 was the election of the board with 100 candidates to cover two vacancies. Wagner Maya from 2022 to 2025, and Javier Salazar from 2022 to 2025 in Mexico. 11% of the community participated. So the re one of the functions that we have assigned in addition to the statutes, now we have the community. Now we've been asked to survey the co-moderator. We have AS ASOAC and the NRRC. Each electoral process requires actions by the members of the electoral committee to validate the uh, um, candidates for each of the elections. This uh, calendar is very important for the entire community because it will help us refresh what we are to expect for the next meetings. So in the near future, we have the elections of the fiscal committee, and then we have the proposal of ASO-RC and then the board. So um, this is for you to have the knowledge you need and to participate. So we've seen that in the report, you may have realized that the number of voters is very low, 10, 11, 12 percent. That's very low. So we want you to support us, and we want the people to continue to contribute and to support and to participate. And when and we want you to take your time and vote, because that will determine how the community works. If you don't show enough interest, well, we are going to see that if people vote in 10%, 11%, we want a more representation. We request your support. So the committee 
can also support us because they, the the committee is here to support any of the people here. If you have any problems, you can come here and you can ask us about any problems that you may have. So we already know that the next, next electoral process is of the fiscal committee. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. We thank the support of the electoral committee and your participation is uh, of key importance to preserve uh, the institutional process. All right. This morning, um, after the opening, Laura Kaplan presented a summary of activities and the way that we do in the community. Uh, I'm not going to repeat it, but it's available in the minute site of the assembly once this presentation is over. But I want to emphasize two elements that are apparently the most relevant. First, the effort that we devote to our events is noticeable and is acknowledged by the participants, not just for you, the members, but the rest of the community that participates of the, the events. We have a high level of satisfaction in both annual events. You can see that the top two boxes, that is this mechanism counting the two largest or best re satisfaction responses, reach about 98% very uh, of excellence and 94% in the case of LACNIC 37. This survey is good not just to tell you that there's a high degree of, uh, of satisfaction, but also to ratify some areas of opportunity, including the case of the network when something goes wrong in an event or some logistics issue when something is not uh, of your entire satisfaction. And the other element is the evolution of the LACNIC campus, where we have incorporated not just more courses, but also we are ensuring that this that they are of good quality. So, and this is something that you say in the courses. Whenever those courses are completed, we request people to assess to evaluate and we have levels of excellence and this is very important because these courses are free of charge for all the members and you can take as many courses as you may require and the good news is that in addition to incorporating more courses we are also incorporating the specializations that will enable you to get a certificate in three different areas including network operations, ISP, campus, and data centers. The, they are different orientations. They have a, norm, a common basis, but different orientations. And each of them has different courses that will be uh, enabled in uh, future months. There are many courses available, as you can see, but we will incorporate uh, further courses in future months to conclude the specializations if you are going through them. So all these slides that Laura, uh, Laura presented them, so I won't give you any further details, but it is important to, to mention something that Laura didn't mention, and that is the support of recent years to the creation of IXPs as an important element in the stability of the internet and especially of in our post-pandemic times. Last year, we devoted a training workshop to NAP Colombia and PIT Bolivia, uh, as uh, LAC IX Associates and ICSI, and also root servers in Panama IXP of Dominican with the installation of a DNS root service and PROSBA and the IXP of the Internet of Panama, we help them install BGP collectors. And we do this 
under the agreement we have with Ike, LAC Ike X. And it's been a very interesting uh, work because we managed to do the most uh, of the resources that everybody of us, the IXPs, to coordinate so that the three organizations should not, well, we may assign all of the resources to one and others are left with none. So this has been very effective and hopefully we'll remain with the, these um, collaborations for the benefit of the IXPs of the region. So here's the map. Sorry, I hadn't clicked on it. So these are the supports of the IXPs. And this year, of course, we still have the supports and coordinations. There's a lot of activity in Mexico. In the morning session, you may have heard the initiatives for the creation of IXPs. And somehow, we will support you when you are training. And sometimes, well, we don't get involved. We don't sell IXPs. So when the community decides to create one, it is then that we decide to support them. As to one of our main activities, that is the promotion of the deployment of IPv6, something that we have done for many years, since 2005, if I'm not wrong, has been to promote technical capacities for the deployment of IPv6. And we are happy that because the deployment has had a significant increase in recent years, three out of 10 packets are IPv6, but it is also true that we have seen a stagnation of the speed of deployment in recent years. On the other hand, the adoption of RPKI in the region has increased from 40 to 50 percent in this last year. A key element to achieve all these services for the members and the community is the processes that we have to provide those services. Although that is transparent for you, it's important for you to know that insofar as we maintain these processes efficient, repetitive, measurable, we can ensure more effectively the services that we provide you. The first of them is capacity to communicate with you effect effectively, not just producing excellent services or providing you excellent services, but also approaching you through different means for you to know those services. We do that through different means, not just our website, but also through social media, including uh, uh, Meet, uh, uh, Instagram, or webinars that uh, um, Laura Kaplan mentioned this morning. We also try to participate, to actively participate in some activities, forums, events, uh, to positively uh, have an impact on some regulatory processes of consultation of the countries. And the idea is that we should handle the relevant elements of the technical principles of the Internet. In, estos, in, estos in 2022, there were 37 active presentations as members of the panel or speakers sharing the messages to more than 2,000 participants, including governments, experts, academia, or the general community. As support mechanisms for decision-making, we have some systems to support management and to the decision-making process that allow us to more precisely identify and analyze the problems in a more effective way. We have built a large number of information processes to assist us with our activities so as to ensure 
that we are considering the different elements to be included in the decision-making process. In order to ensure these repeatable processes, we have obtained the ISO 9001 2015 certification for the three key processes, which are namely the registry resource, uh, resource registration process, the organization of events, and the policy development process, which are the three substantial elements of LACNIC. And we once again obtained this certification in 2022. They didn't identify any findings and did not detect any non-conformities or any observations. So this is an extraordinarily positive certification. Additionally, as part of the threats that took place during and also following the pandemic, you are all aware that the number of attacks to internet security and to in the infrastructure have increased. So we conducted an analysis of information security that was specific, although we did have a methodology for identifying risks and to other aspects regarding the security, our technological infrastructure and documentation, we wanted to make a specific analysis of information security so as to provide follow-up to these risks. All these elements, all these elements were submitted to the board. These are new risks that we identified, and the board can then ensure that we are providing treatment, for example, eliminating the risk, reducing the risk, or managing the risk, but ignoring the risk is no option. Ultimately, that is why we apply this methodology. You will see that in the end, there was an increase in the number of risks, but we're also working in reducing these risks. And it is preferable to realize that we do have those vulnerability and to work on these and not to ignore these in order to not end up with a greater problem. So this has been very positive and that we is why we created the risk committee mentioned by Alejandro. We already had a risk committee, but this was now expanded. It's now called Risk and Information Security Committee. And in order to carry out all these processes, we have the human capital. So this is a brief report of our staff for 2020U. We have the following nationalities in the staff, Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, Spain, Panama, Trinidad, Tobago, Mexico, Cuba, and Peru. The average age is 39.6 years. The majority are women. This has been the case for the past six to seven years. And the average seniority of the collaboration is 6.83 years. Last year, we had th five new incorporations. Two people left the organization and 12 were promoted within the organizations with increased responsibilities or in changes in their roles. This is the age average by gender in the different age ranges. As Alejandra mentioned, for us, it is crucial and fundamental to have an adequate working environment and climate. We like to have that great organizational climate in the organization because this environment enhances productivity. It contributes to achieving the objectives and the service we provide. We ranked third as a great place to work in 2022 for women in Uruguay, and this seeks to reduce the gap between the satisfaction Finally, as part of our strategic outlook, we have the organizational resilience. What we assessed or what we ensured to obtain are those elements that ensure sustainability and in case something would fail, the capacity to respond and overcome these challenges. One of the elements we identified is that 
this has been the year with the lowest level of areas and very limited number of revocations based on debts. Nevertheless, the number of entities that joined the revocation process has increased. We are aware of the reasons in some cases. Sometimes arrears are explained by some specific situations that challenge the organizations in order to comply with the payment processes. And in some cases, these are bureaucratic processes. I'm referring to the case of Mexico and Argentina. We are up to date with the situation, and the board has also seen how they can support them. Last year, those who wish to check the minutes of the meetings will see that we had a conversation in this regard, and we continue exploring solutions, but also offered some options to respond to these special situations. As you are aware, the board has defined a policy for generating reserves for times of crisis or emergencies. This is an amount that is defined according to recommendations and based on the net operational expenses. So if we were to have a crisis of whatever nature to obtain resources, we could maintain the operations without affecting the services or without affecting legal commitments that we have. So we are now going back to the defined levels in our reserve policy. The objective is not to accumulate resources just for the sake of it, but rather to have a backup in the event of economic disasters. And what we can tell you is that we are more closer and closer to the benchmark, and that is appropriate. Although this peak over here was a situation that took place during the pandemic where we couldn't use the resources as we wish because we didn't have in-person events. And as I was saying a while ago, in-person events such as these uh, consume a large number of resources, not only in terms of time and energy, but also economic resources. Finally, risk management. This is one of the main priorities of the board to know that we are managing risks. It is a decision of the board to establish the threshold based on which certain risks require special attention and treatment. So as I mentioned on other occasions, the risk threshold for the board are those that we see in the red zone. These are this is for 2021. The risk level at that time was 85. This is an arbitrary number. This is a scale we defined internally, but the target is not to exceed 225. Why 225? This is because we think this is the number of topics that we can pay attention to without getting distracted and affecting the operations. This year, the risk was increased because of all the risk identified in the information security analysis. We responded to these, and today, let me tell you that we are back at levels similar to those in 2021, but this is a picture as at December the 31st and the number of risks that we see in the red zone. But you will note that follow-up is done to more than 200 risk elements or actions or risky events. This summarizes what we have done. If you wish to revise any of these activities, I invite you to review our annual report, which has been included as part of the information resources in the link to the assembly. Or when you watch this presentation, you can click on this image and you will find the detailed annual report for 2022 with links to many more resources. That would be all on my behalf, but the report is not yet finished because we now want to have the financial import. So I invite Diego, Mina, Gabriel to share with us the information, the financial information. Gabriel Adonayo. 
Thank you, Oscar. Good afternoon, everyone. We will now share with you a summary of the responsibilities of the Treasury. As Alejandro was saying a while ago, the position of the board are agreed on at the beginning of every year by its members and have a one-year duration. Wartner Meyer, whom I personally wish a fast recovery, and myself are in charge of the important responsibility of the treasury of this organization. We represent the board regarding the activities involving the financial aspects and uh, related to the executive director, the management department, and the external auditors. Regarding the operational aspects, these are in the hands of LACNIC staff, particularly the financial department. We're also part of the finance committee and respond to the work involved for finances, and we have a regular review of four main areas, the budget, the reserves, the investments, and the balance. This leads us to maintain a close follow-up of the finances through a fluent communication between the parties that make up this committee. Now the financial manager, Diego Mena, will be showing us the financial report and the report of the external orders. Diego then will tell us about the work carried out and the corresponding report. In that sense, I'd like to express my thanks on behalf of the board to the members of the Fiscal Committee for the time dedicated to this task. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I will now share with you what might be useful to you to better understand the financial report. As all of you are aware, for the sake of transparency, LACNIC hires an external auditor to express a rep to produce a report on the balance of the organization. It also defines a rotation in the external auditors, which change every three years. KPMG has been with us since last year and will be with us next year, until next year. This year, this is the report of KPMG. The detailed information, the financial statements, and the report, the opinion of the auditors was shared with our members. During 2022, we had three external facts with a global impact, and this had a financial impact on the organization. Although the return to normality after the pandemic had a very positive impact from the operational standpoint, and we could resume activities and the in-person events, and all this implies, there was a financial impact as a result of the higher spending in terms of dissemination, travel, related to the activities of our organization. At the same time, the in-person activities generate a larger amount of interest by our sponsors and also have a greater income through sponsors. There are two factors or two elements that occurred last year and were not positive, namely the conflict in Ukraine and the inflation in the United States with which both had a financial impact on the organization. In the, case of the in, Ukraine, in the first case, in Ukraine, although it had an impact on the financial results, the impact was barely 3% of our investment portfolio, minor than uh, that of other organizations in the ecosystem, because in, that, in those cases, the impact was a two-digit impact. So, that we feel that uh, the uh, investment policy approved at the time by the by the board was appropriate. In the case of the, the inflation of dollar, this had a significant impact, increasing our operational uh, spending both in dollars with an inflation adjustment and in uh, Uruguayan pesos that represent uh, more dollars. 
So, now let's see the current uh, financial status. To your left, in the screen, you can see the assets, that is, the goods uh, and rights of the organization. To the right, you can see the liabilities, the debts, uh, obligations, and the net uh, 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 capital, the difference between uh, the uh, Act the assets and uh, the uh, liabilities. And here you see that there's almost no variation as compared to the previous year. And this is due to the result of the year was almost nil. We are going to see this when we see the results of the year. In that regard, the, we only have internal variations in the uh, patrimonial chapters in the net worth. Now, let's see the results of the year. Here we can see a summary, a very high level, how we reach these results. The operational uh, revenues increased by 5%, while the operational uh, expenditures and the other net results had a significant increase, essentially because of the impact of the factors that we mentioned earlier. Now, we are going to discuss each component of the results, starting with the operational revenues. There are two elements that um, include the variation. We had a 60% uh, reduction a bit, uh, for the ASNs of ISBs. Um, the, the, it was a 50% discount. Uh, this accounted for 80% of the ASNs uh, that uh, were invoiced in 2022. Under other uh, revenues, we see uh, the increased uh, uh, increase correspondent to um, the revenues uh, for sponsors for the annual events of Electronic. And then we see in January 22, we see the uh, period of implementation of this extraordinary discount for the minor categories by the board. As to the operational spend expenditures, the principal variations are in remunerations, essentially because of the increase of the wages in uh, Uruguay and um, the devaluation of the dollar, where more than 70% of the staff are in Uruguayan pesos. and. Going back to normality post pandemic has increased the chapters that were worst affected, that is, dissemination and uh, travels, and a reduction in the chapters related to extraordinary activities to contribute with the community during the pandemic. Finally, we have other net results here. The greatest impact is for financial investment product of the conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine and the impact on the financial market, we had to sell some uh, uh, assets that we had in our investment portfolio complying with the current policies. On the other hand, uh, the inflation in the United States generated a devaluation of the dollar vis-a-vis -vis the Uruguayan peso, which is reflected in the, through the uh, uh, exchange rate that is the last line that you can observe there. Inflation in the United States and the devaluation of dollar is something that worries us. And as a matter of fact, it's progressively limiting our capacity for execution. So Oscar later on will share information about the initiatives that are pu being pushed forward by the board. We are working to recover part of that lost capacity. Now, I'm going to invite the members of the Fiscal Committee, Hernán Archidiacono, Adriana Ibarra, and Aristoteles Dantas, who will tell us about their work, and they will share their opinion. I am ready to clarify any questions about uh, the information you may provide. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adriana Ibarra, and with my colleagues Hernan and Ari, 
We are members of the Fiscal Committee. The Fiscal Committee consists of three members selected and uh, voted by the members, by you, the members of LACNIC. Our work is to represent you, to represent the community based on the powers that are in the statutes. In this slide, we show the three key roles but we, let me practice, let me explain and practice what we do. And I'm going to again emphasize that we are elected by you, by the community. We are independent. That is, we do not belong to the staff of LACNIC. We do not belong to the board. We are not the external auditors, as was pointed. Uh, by Diego, it is KPMG. We and we go to Montevideo once a year, and we have uh, a meeting with uh, the external auditors, with the board, uh, to check that there is independence of uh, the decision of the external um, auditors. And now, Ari is going to tell you a bit more of what we do. So you vote us for a three-year period. Each is renewed every year, and we present at uh, the assembly. We present a report, and we will say yes. We approve. Uh, we support the approval of the financial statements uh, based on what we saw in our trip. We also want to tell you that we are at your disposal as uh, the members of the committee of the electoral committee said if you have any doubts you can approach us and my colleagues will continue to uh, explain how this works as adriana said our function consists of a visit we are about one year and a half or two, depending on the year, and we receive information. And based on that, sometimes early still, and based on that, we ask questions and we ask evidence when we need it. So bringing this to earth, down to earth, we received a presentation by the executive director telling us the main activities of the year, just as you did now. We receive a presentation on the execution of the budget with the proper explanations, the financial reports, the external auditor in recent years, it was by KPMG. Then we stayed at a private meeting with the external auditor. And this is important because although we are free to ask many things, we feel even freer to ask them privately to the auditor. And this is a space that LACNIC gives us to do it. We see the results of the audits to the RIRs, and we receive an update on the policies and processes that may have changed, because then afterwards we can use them to know what evidence to request when reviewing the processes or policies. We check what happened with the old suggestions that we had recommended to the previous board the previous year to see whether they were considered and if they were, how were they solved. And with all that, we ask many questions and we request for evidence, of course, by sampling, to see uh, whether things have been done. And based on that, we end up with giving our opinion. In this case, of course, it was favorable and suggesting new things for improvement for next year. So now I'll give the floor to the uh, decision that Aristotle will tell you about. Good afternoon, everybody. Those uh, here and those in Zoom. So I have the formal part and 
I'm going to read about our work in Monte that was uh, uh, performed in Montevideo, the opinion of the the decision of the fiscal um, committee. Article 527 of the articles uh, approved in access of the registry of uh, internet addresses uh, for Latin America and uh, the Caribbean, uh, here and after LACNIC by Hernán José Aristóteles Lantas and Adriana Ibarras. At the meeting was uh, in person. So, in attention to what we issued the decision about the accounting st statements for the exercise finished in December 2022 and the independent audit report. Conclusions first. We reviewed the results of the audit of the accounting uh, statements of the exercise completed in uh, December 2022 by KPMG as an independent aud auditor. The result of that audit has been favorable and uh, the accounting statement uh, referred present and in, in all the significant aspects present uh, the uh, uh, net worth of uh, LACNIC as of December 2022. So stemming from the analysis of the fiscal committee of the report by the independent auditor and the documentation presented as requested by LACNIC, we conclude that the data represented reasonably reflect uh, the net worth of LACNIC as of December 20, 31st, 2022. So we advise it to be approved by the General Assembly in uh, compliance with the bylaws of LACNIC. March 21st, 2023, Fiscal Committee. Thank you. Could you enable the, the microphone on the table, please? Very good. We want to thank for all the reports that were presented. Now, before we vote for the approval of these reports, I'd like to give the floor to anybody who has any question about the reports, but this is a good time to do it. Apparently, there are no questions. If there are no further qu uh, comments, now uh, I propose we should vote for the approval of the financial statements, the report of the external auditors, the fiscal committee, and uh, the statement by the board. So now we open uh, the system for uh, registering the votes. Remember the instructions, how to vote. If you run into any problems, please do not hesitate and let us know. In the second screen, we are not seeing the details of the, the election. I don't know whether you can activate it for the members to be able to see what's going on.
Sí, sí. Si alguien tiene problemas. If anyone has any issues with the voting, please raise your hand so we can help you. Over there, on the right. Alguien tiene problemas para votar? Does anyone else have issues with voting? Please let us know. Someone here in the middle. Nos activan el segundo micrófono. Can we enable the second microphone over here? Thank you. ¿Alguien más que falte por votar? Aquí estoy. Anyone else has issues with voting?
Perfecto. Muy bien. Perfecto. Ready? Okay. Anyone else? So let us now close the voting system. Against, zero votes. In favor, 581. 27 abstentions and 27 did not vote. Total number is 635. And in the 630 votes, counting those in the room, approved by a majority, approved by a majority. Now we will consider item number three in the order of business, update of the membership fees and proposal for implementation. As we said, the board decided to modify this item in the agenda and not to vote this today. But we will submit the information to the assembly. This will be presented for information purposes and we will be voting this later on. And we will explain the background of this proposal so that the members are aware of this. And Oscar will make this presentation. Thank you, Alejandro. I will now make a presentation of part of the information that we already shared with you in the information webinar. Now, what we have noted and we see in this graph are the bars in orange and how and the budget and the gradual devaluation and how this was affected by the devaluation over the past 15 years. This is a result of the inflation of the dollar, which is the currency in which we receive our income. Each red part of the bar is the devaluation of our income. Every, the dollars were worth less and less. By the end of this period, in 2020, each dollar was worth 67 cents. In the terms of our execution capacity, this was a reduction in our capacity. This was not immediate, as you can note in the graph. This occurred gradually. However, the number of new members and the growth we had year after year allowed us to compensate that devaluation. Now, the situation became even more serious in the last years of the pandemic when the dollar inflation exceeded the normal ranges. The growth we had in terms of members and the income from the members could no longer counteract this difference. Today, we're in a situation in which we have lost more than 30% of our execution capacity and a large part of this was in previous in the past years during the pandemic we couldn't have done anything and far from correcting this problem what we had to do was to apply a special discount in 2021 somehow to adjust to the situation that the members were experiencing. Now, this is not something that is urgent. There's no imminent damage for the coming months. Of course, you have just seen that we have a significant level of reserves, but the reserves are not there to be used continuously in our operations. The reserves are there for emergency situations, and this is not an emergency situation. This is a structural damage. So if we continue like this, sooner or later we'll be in a critical situation. Now, the decision of the board is not to decide to increase the membership fees. This is your decision. It is a decision made by the members. The board is responsible for identifying this problem and to explain this to you, the situation we have, as well as some ideas to figure out a solution. Like Alejandro was men had mentioned, we're not submitting a proposal. This will not be voted. But we should all be aware of the situation we are facing and what would like to avoid happening in the coming years. So when the board voted the 
budget for this year, for 2023, we had to leave aside some of the regular expenses that affect our services and the service we provide to our members. For example, we had to reduce the number of visits to the members. We will recall that we have a program that consists in visiting our members. We go directly to visit them or we go to events where a large number of our community is located. So we had to reduce this and in some cases even cancel some of these. We also had to cancel some of the initiatives we had during these events, for example, simultaneous transcription. So this takes away accessibility and for people who participate remotely. And this includes other issues that have an impact on the services and the quality of the spaces we have for to help you participate in the events. We had a 50% reduction in some of the projects with the communities. Some projects that you mentioned in the satisfaction surveys that the information obtained from those studies are very relevant. And this is one of the elements you value the highest. That is why we continue organizing these. And obviously, this also has an impact on our infrastructure and also affects our execution capacity. For example, we have had to reduce the capacity of some of the developments. For example, the capacity to implement new policies is divided between implementing new policies and also implementing improvements to the Milaknik console in order to allow members that have a large amount of resources to carry out massive transactions. So these are awaiting. And also renewal of the RPKI and the IRR are also included in the same waiting pipeline, awaiting resources. And why does this occur? Basically because we have some of the membership fees that have not been updated since 2017. These membership fees, if we were to adjust this by inflation every year, this increase would be a 25 accumulated increase. That is why we are behind in terms of 25%. In other categories, there is a even greater misadjustment. Some have not even been affected since 2010. So this issue regarding the inflation adjustment accounts for 20, 42%. There are also some categories that have not been effect, changed since 2008. Nevertheless, many, none of these updates, 2018, 2010, and 17, these were never adjusted for inflation reasons. These were to provide benefits that did not exist at the time. At any rate, the inflation delay hits us in our capacity of execution that we mentioned just a few minutes ago. If we had to draw an average of uh, the cost and uh, how much the reduction of how much we reduce our uh, capacities, that is 38 percent. That is that our services are 38 uh, percent less than at the time? No, because much of this deficiency was compensated with efficiency. Much of this evaluation was compensated with operational efficiency. The capacity, the fact of having more uh, associates gives us a better quality uh, scale. And to a great extent, we have made up for that loss of capacity, financial capacity. The bad news is that this is not enough. And especially, as I told you, this is a damage that we will continue to see. We can't bet. To, we, we, uh, th these deficiencies will, will still be there, and we are convinced and we look for that uh, efficiency. The problem is that when there are periods with a great 
financial devaluation, it is difficult to keep it at that level. It's already happened that um, uh, dis those discussions with the board where we asked them what we needed to do, whether we had to reduce our execution capacity, should we reduce our size, should we leave aside services, characteristics of the services, and if we do, to how far should we do it? Are we ready so that uh, some of these services or benefits to the members may have an impact on the quality of the registry? Definitely, the question is no. That's not what they want to do, because that implies worse affection. Of affecting more the quality of our services. The board at the time resolved that we had to recover a fraction of that execution capacity. It is no longer possible to recover 100% and to maintain that execution capacity, but at least we want to recover a fraction so as to have that level of services. However, it's not just one activity that we'll do. We are not just uh, doing one thing. We don't relax just by increasing the fees. What we have increased since we said that to the board is three, four um, activities or actions or strategies. One of them is using a fraction of our reserves because the reserves are there for emergency or specific projects or with the beginning and the end and we don't want them to be recurrent expenditure because that jeopardizes the reserves. So the board has already been told that under exceptional cases, for instance, if we had to do a technological um, renewal for guarantees or some delicate issues, we won't wait. We have to draw from our reserves for that uh, expenditure and some other types of expenditure. We have to continue to deploy APV6. We did this even before the situation became apparent, not just because of the financial benefit, but because it is part of a raison d'etre. We want to maintain uh, an effective deployment in the region to ensure that we have a complete uh, promise of the Internet of Things to ensure an adequate uh, and stable operation, to ensure that the operators may have better quality, reduce uh, latency, and uh, some, for instance, in the use of NAT. The third action that uh, the board asked us was to promote more revenues for the events. In our case, our events are a deficit. They are spending. Although we have sponsors, they cover just a fraction from 25 to 30 percent of the cost of the event. So one of the indications was to work better on sponsors. And you may see that in this occasion, we have a number of stands of booths for sponsors that is much more important, more visible that in previous years. So we are already working at that. We don't need your time to start doing that. Basically, that is part of our operation. And also, unfortunately, we had to limit the geographic diversity of the venues. This started in 2024. What does this mean? We have tried to travel, to be, do itinerary travels to approach these communities. You may have seen that 30% of the people here were Mexicans, and I'm sure that many of you were from the southeast, precisely of the community that has become very vibrant with the Lixit project and some other small ISPs. This is very good for LACNIC because we may reach a community that we wouldn't have reached uh, uh, otherwise. And they come to us and they present their challenges and we can present the quality of the problem that it has a cost because reaching places where services are more limited, we cannot, uh, there's no competition 
or the uh, either the rooms or uh, the network or all of the above so one of the indications of the board is to limit that geographic diversity and look for more practical locations easier in many ways essentially economically so starting in 2024 we are going to reduce this fact that we come to a range of uh, places but even so we'll need to look for some solutions and finally number five is updating the membership fees always thinking that it's not arbitrary that we try to somehow recover a fraction of our capacity of execution so we would need events uh, equal to or the inflation but we, we are not planning to recover everything we lost uh, through inflation some of the considerations that we have established to look for solutions some some of them have these elements these characteristics if we tried to recover all that capacity we would have to see the inflation that has gone by since 2008 till the present but basically we said well if we do that some categories will be more affected and that may be difficult to explain let's start from scratch starting in 2018 the last update of some of the fees of LACNIC that were in 2017 therefore the board was told let's start with the 2018 inflation the accumulation since uh, 2018 so far let's try to apply it to all the categories of IPv4 precisely because it's due to inflation we're not looking for anything different from that both for ISPs and end users that no categories no adjustments above uh, their corresponding inflation so it will have to be lower than 25 percent uh, if IPv6 doesn't go up, the, we will com be consistent of, of implementing IPv6 and even giving the message not only that IPv4 is scarce, but that that scarcity has an appropriate increase of in by inflation or economic. In addition, as if we, if we are realistic, the IPv4 space, the cost that it has in LACNIC is one and what it has in the secondary market outside LACNIC what you end up uh, renting from other services is 10 to 15 times more expensive another consideration that we're given by the board is that ASNs shouldn't increase especially because this is an element of entry for many members and precisely we don't want to hit the barriers head on applicable to initial memberships and revocations and that we could consider implementing them in different increases in different um, uh, and uh, what we have in the end is the need to recover a fraction of that um, operation capacity if we see that this is what we lost in this period we are trying to recover only one fraction it's not that we are trying to recover 100 percent we can forget about this precisely because of what uh, he was saying of these efficiencies that we achieved and what do we want to achieve if we recover this fraction well basically maintaining the levels of excellence in these services in the services that you receive and that you need and of course preserve the high level of engagement of the elements of the national community as Alejandro said your presentation you are there's a number of uh, activities that are requested by bylaw it is not something that we prefer to do or to be because it's nice yes we want to do it because it's nice we want to do a good job but also because it's required by the bylaws so the levels of excellent in 
uh, services is, is the key priority. It's a key priority. So I was show uh, so I was showing you. This is among the highest results in recent years. The level of satisfaction of events like this is also a high priority. Continuing to with these uh, events so that you may benefit with significant networking with people that are going to be key to your operations. That is very important for us. And indeed, the institutional processes like this, where we are held accountable to our members are essential. The training that I just mentioned, not just the number of sources, but uh, the quality of the courses. Our complete project approaching uh, the members. This is a summary of the last four years of 2019. Despite the pandemic, we maintained some activities uh, approaching, although some could be done prior to the pandemic. And as I told you, the efforts building community are not an option. Maybe the members can say, well, why do we devote efforts for, uh, to receive people who are not members? Well, because they are also important for you. But they're also, so they're, those supports that we have made for the IXPs, those supports that we obtained through Frida for measurements, for research uh, projects, those efforts for applied research have resulted in benefits for you. Maybe not all of them. Maybe there are no specific benefits for all, but sooner or later, they'll have a positive impact on the community. And as I said, this is part of our social uh, object. Uh, the first two elements are the registry of resources and allocation of resources. But all these are the process of construction of the community that we have discussed permanently. And the last is the definition of policies, the rules. So. This is what would be expected once we can adjust these quotas to maintain the quality of these services and these levels of excellence. Now, we know that this is a problem. Having reached this point and with having to apply such a significant uh, raise. Nobody likes it when there's an increase, but it's it's horrible when when it's a significant raise. But we have no choice. We try to recover a fraction, not even 100 percent. Fraction. But even if we were to recover a fraction of that, we have lost all this. And by the way, we have also lost the area under the curve, which is a straight line. So what we lost is something that you have gained because you have saved that over the past 15 years. But you also received quality services. At least this is evidenced in the surveys that show that we have maintained consistent levels of satisfaction in our services. So this has been savings for you. But now this has really reached some levels that we think uh, have to be taken into account. And what we said is that we should recover a fraction of that value one year and on the following year. And after that, to forget this part over here. Now, the point is that these are quite important increases. How can we avoid this? Well, figuring out a way that can be somehow how we quote the services every year, applying the annual inflation, the inflation of that year, 2% or 5%, the way in which we are used to plan our spending without any surprises or with significant leaps. So this is what I have just explained. Therefore, what we are seeking is the following. Once we have that recovery, we can then 
go back to the levels of what we had at the time, or maybe the board might decide that one year an update might not be required because this is not necessary or might be a critical situation globally that does not allow us to do that, so we have to wait a, f a f period. This is if we were to recover the entire annual inflation. But we also have the possibility of recurring just a percentage of that annual inflation. As I was saying, we don't have a specific proposal. These are some of the options we have explored. And once we have greater clarity on this, we'll be communicating with the membership in order to define how we'll be making these different proposals. But we want this to prevent this from happening in the future. We want to ensure that the is a um, correction of that inflation and would like the board to have that capacity to react until the maximum limit of the inflation. Anything above the inflation would necessarily have to be justified with the membership, if at all, if we would reach that situation at all. So having said that, this is what I had commented. So what do we have to do to prevent this from happening again? We will have to assign the board the responsibility of analyzing the inflationary factors, economic factors of the market. We are in a complicated region, so the board should be able to make an adjustment of the membership fees up to the level of the accumulated inflation. Now. Regardless of the above, we have to continue requiring the staff to be operationally efficient. So recovering the inflation, despite that, we have to be efficient on, in the, on as a staff. To sum up, we cannot ignore the problem of the accumulated inflation over the past years. This inflation, the inflation exists in all our countries, and governments have the absolute power of printing money irresponsibly. We'll continue to have inflation in our countries and in the traditional currencies. Therefore, we cannot prevent from transmitting to you the impact of this accumulated inflation and how this is affecting our operations and therefore on the services we offer. I already mentioned the costs we had to eliminate. Of course, the things that affect you the least and the things that affect us the least, but this is not sustainable. It would be responsible on our side not to present this situation. It would be most irresponsible, but we're also aware that this has had an impact and the board has been able to identify that this is not the appropriate moment until this need is clarified. Now. The decisions that depend on the board have already been implemented or in the process of being implemented, and these will be followed up, and this will take place regardless of the solution we will finally approve for the membership fees, because precisely what we are doing already is not enough. It does not solve the problem in the medium term. Therefore, we make an appeal to your understanding and to your responsibilities so we can recover that operational capacity at LACNIC and that LACNIC remains relevant as a regional community collaborating with all the other organizations and favoring these spaces for interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar, for your presentation. I'd like to take this opportunity to say that for us, the commitment is always to do 
things that are rational, that are based on fact for the benefit of the organization and for the benefit of our membership. That is why we are convinced that the measures that will be proposed will be the correct ones in absolute terms. Nail me to be sure that you are aware of this decision because to make an informed decision when voting is essential. That is why we decided not to vote today. This is also a call to use the information provided to the members. We are all aware that you're all very busy, that you have lots and lots of emails, and this is not always easy. But as an organization, we have to communicate these things, and we also want to have the opportunity to have your feedback. We communicate the proposals in time. So we'd really like you to take your time to read the proposals and have your feedback before proceeding. Recently, about two years ago, we decided to do something more than just sending out the information, as is done in many organizations. So we added the webinars. These webinars is to tell you ahead of time what we intend to do, and also to have your feedback, your opinions, your ideas, and your questions. Now, unfortunately, this mechanism has not been used as much as possible. From 12,000 members, only 30 participated, and unfortunately, and I like to be very direct, unfortunately, people who hadn't even been at the webinar started to disseminate in the social media mistaken information on this proposal. So this leads to disinformation. So because we are an internet community, we want to based our decisions on clear information, and we are here to deliver that precise information. So instead of disseminating inadequate information and without the adequate source, we have always been very transparent with all the information for decision making. So we really want to interact with you and to provide the information we have. So I'd like to take this opportunity for that. I'd also like to open the opportunity now to see if you have any comments or questions on this situation. This is the opportunity to do so. Hello. I have a question. As from when do you expect to understand which would be the additional percentage to apply to the annual membership fees. We're not going to be voting that today. This is, we'll be voting this once we have really informed this to all the members and when we are clear as to which is the best path to follow. We are aware that uh, increase in just one stage is quite high, so we want to invest the next weeks and months to determine what is the adequate percentage. This will be, then be submitted to an assembly probably, probably next year. And when this comes into force, well, much later. So depending on what is decided, there is a period for implementation that will take some time. and. The percentage will depend on the decision. But once again, to reinforce what Oscar said, the amount will depend on the moment this is done, but we want to recover part of that capacity. And maybe this will be achieved over a period of a couple of years in a stepwise stage. To sum up, you will learn about this once you have a proposal. There has to be an assembly that approves this. This won't take place here. It will be at the next assembly, and we have to follow the previous information process. And my other question, this gradual process for increase, is it going to be to catch up the rate of the past years? So once a stability is reached, financially speaking, will you continue to carry out annual adjustments? as part of the role of the board in order to avoid having the accumulated impact we have had. Is that so? Yes. And the proposal basically is, first, the way we see it is what Oscar is saying. For many years, we have had no increases, but the spending did increase. The expenditure did increase. But now, when we increased 
this is considered like a important increase but no increase took place so somehow there were savings but an uh, in high percentage will have an impact so we already are aware of that so we want to ensure that this is acceptable for the membership and once we reach the level of stability if required to have an increase this will be at a rate below that of the inflation rate or equal to the inflation rate of that year thank you please state your name and the organization you represent Good afternoon, Jorge Maria Valencia from Colombia. More than a question, this is like an appeal to the board in the sense of an increase in the membership fees. I represent an association of hospitals in Risaralda where we have been conducting an exercise of achieving connectivity with the poorest hospital. And you are probably familiar with this. Some hospitals are at distant places that cater to indigenous populations and vulnerable populations. And we have noted the limited participation of the state to achieve the connectivity between the hospitals. In Colombia, there is a regulation now whereby the public enterprises in the territory have to go through a transition from IPv4 to IPv6. The large gap was identified in the response capacity of these low-income entities, paying a 2,500 fee has been very difficult for many companies. So what have we done? We have organized activities and projects in order to obtain the support for achieving that transition and respond to the needs of these low-income entities. So for example, I'm referring to the region I represent. The end user entities, well, we have to analyze the possibility of these companies that have a low purchasing capacity to pay a fee, and these have to be done in accordance to the regulations. So the board could maybe consider such situations where they don't have this capacity to pay an increase. So let us see how we'd like to see how to respond to the needs of these capacities, but to look at these situations so that they can complete the connectivity process. Can you repeat your name? Jorge Mario Valencia. Thank you very much, Jorge. With that aim, we already have a solution, and I will explain. The problem is that if we don't figure out a solution for this situation, we'll very short run out of these solutions. I will tell you two ways to figure out a solution. The board has a decision that dates back to 2015, which is reducing the IPv6 only fee for those members who only have IPv6 and who are not paying the full membership fee of the $2,000. Today, they pay $800. So firstly, this also helps to those who have IPv6 only. Now, those entities that play a social role, namely that are non-profit organizations and have a social goal and have economic difficulties, we already have a mechanism to exempt them from payments. I will then let you know how to follow that procedure so that you are exempted from paying that fee. So far, only a limited number of entities have requested us to do so. And we want these to be entities that really deserve and need to have that exemption from the fee. In addition to that, we have a mechanism for nonprofit organizations who pay 50%. So we have different solutions. But I repeat once again, if we don't figure out a solution to the problem we have, we'll soon run short and will not be able to respond to situations such as those. And another clarification, the 
five. The 2,500 is only initially because the quota of an end user is 600. Maybe it sounds a lot for end user, but I want you to give you the real name, the real number, because the first time you are asked 2,500 and then for renewal it's 600. So the left uh, corridor. Can you hear me? Let me introduce myself. I'm Faculdo Fernandez. I, I work for Atlantia Video Cabre. I'm operator of Argentina of uh, 40,000 uh, people. It's an SME, a family company. First of all, I, I thank you for the explanation of the CEO and that the board has opted to listen to the community because maybe the perception that I had personally was that rather than a, an economic problem, this is a communication problem. Why isn't it an economic problem? Because we are small and medium, speaking of a 10% increase from one year to the other, we are speaking of 100, 200, 500 dollars more. I don't think that it's a problem for a company, not even in Argentina, where in the last 12 months uh, the official uh, exchange rate is 100 percent. But we understand the dynamic of inflation, and there we are the leaders. So we understand that there, that position that you sometimes take trying to wait for something to improve, it won't happen. And then we have what happened, that we accumulated the effects of inflation, and today we want to accommodate something that makes perception difficult. Because what I saw analyzing the proposal, I even had to ask, because I didn't know whether it was in one year 23% or in two years there was an alternative. In Argentina, speaking of more than one year, that's science fiction. So I consider that maybe we should have to think from one year to the other, take into account the inflation and the next year um, uh, discussing it again. And thank you for uh, listening to us. And precisely, we, we are also checking what else we can do to communicate better, what is reaches better, because we, we, we are also redoing this. We are also considering how we can improve communication. We, we just can't, we are not good at TikTok, so don't ask. I'm Salvador Vaquero of Neutra Networks from here, from Mexico. And to tell you the truth, the explanation was very clear. Personally, I'm very grateful. And I have just one technical doubt. How do you calculate the percentages of inflation? Because it depends on the country. In America, in uh, these events, it, it, it's a technical issue. But I'm curious about it. How do you reach that figure? Thank you, Salvador. It's the inflation. It's the dollar inflation, because this is the currency that we receive for payments, and that is transferred to the infrastructure services, for instance, in travels and courses, events. So even if we have a good proportion of spending in pesos, the inflation that we have in pesos is 200% in Uruguay in pesos. But sooner or later, as time goes by, those uh, uh, differences get attenuated. Maybe in the short, in the longer term, with the devaluation of countries, there may be um, 
But in the long term, the differences will uh, be equivalent. So when you reduce the inflation because of exchange rates, we may ignore those elements. And also, for, for the sake of simplification, if we see a table of inflation, in our, then that would be much more complicated. Good evening, I'm Erwin Salazar of IX Ecuador. I have a doubt. Oscar, you mentioned limiting the geographic uh, venues for events. Could you explain what you mean by that? What would that mean? Because, because um, the uh, diversity has been so important. That doesn't mean that we are all going to hold them in Panama. But let's not rule that out for a future event. Basically, what the board has asked us was to identify cheaper venues, not just for us, but to travel for our members in the sense of reducing the cost, increasing the number of participants, and make it more appealing for sponsors. Last year, although there were very nice events because we reached communities where we had never been, the problem is that sponsors are a bit more cautious when sponsoring. So we told them where the events would be, and they said, well, let me wait until next year. So that hits us. Organizing events. And it was also difficult to get uh, providers for the local network. And maybe you don't perceive the difference between your events and the regional events because they are different in, in a way. Fairs, exhibits, people are not sitting in front of their computer and with their VPN and working massively with their computer, with their phone, with the other phone and with the iPad, but rather they have a telephone and very often as most of them are local participants, they have their local data and they don't need to connect to the network of the event. So the number of access points that we have to put at an event is beyond the standard. We've in, Very often we have problems because they want to dimension the event as a local event until we explain the sophistication of our participants and that really you have to multiply it by 8, 10, or even 15. So the cost and the quality of the provider gets reduced when we go to complicated. So this doesn't mean that we're all going to go to the same place. We'll have to find cheaper places with a better supply of services, with better uh, flight fees, so they won't uh, give, be a, a deficit. So if we are going to be sponsored, well, we want uh, as many sponsors as we can. Another question? I'm David Cañar from Ecuador, Conesel. Let me start by congratulating all the team of LACNIC. They've worked so hard all these years. The economic part has gone down, but you have maintained efficiency. However, further, I, I'd, I'd like to understand what are the be beneficial, although you have worked efficiently, 
what would be the additional benefits in addition to adding to maintaining your current efficiency? That is the question, and at the same time a recommendation. If you increase, if you already give the increase to each company or each members, what are the additional benefits in terms of what compared to what we have today? Emphasizing, because although it is true that at present we have the efficiency of service, but as we increase the items, we are going to have additional services, including what you say, including increasing the number of participants, etc. So this is a question and a recommendation. Thank you. Yes, if I may, let me show one of the slides. And if not, let me tell you. Basically, we want to recover a fraction of what we have lost in recent years. Yes, we have maintained a certain level of efficiency, but we are not requesting new services and new resources for new services. Despite that, we have gradually introduced new benefits. For instance, Campus Lechnik was not there 10 years ago. Eight years ago, we started with a course, basic IPv6, and somehow, can you put uh, the slide, the one before last? There. That is, we are not requesting any more resources over what we already had to provide new services, but we want to recover a bit. And we believe that with that, we can preserve efficiency, our efficiency or our excellence in service. Why don't I insist? There, there's a way that these services that we are already given, we can enrich them. Maybe you, as you have warning services on some topics because you have open relays of some servers that have some identification and some blacklists or some studies that we have performed. Well, those are part of the aspects that we have tried to improve. First, uh, rather in a rather uh, artisanal way, but uh, trying to help you. Thank you. I'm Jorge Lan of CN Technologies. I have a, a, suggest, a question and a suggestion. The, the question has to do with the new members. I understand that every year there are new members, and I wonder what is the impact? To what extent does it dampen uh, the, inf in the inflation effect? And maybe a suggestion would be to see uh, if people pay faster. I understand that uh, paying faster is uh, uh, a benefit, but maybe the companies have a budget and they are not considering it. Well, initially, people chose it. Um, the growth of new members was very important. We had a very small base, so by increasing the members, that was significant. However, it started to yield. We didn't recover 100% of the inflation, but it was a fraction, and the rest we would made up with efficiency. But the difference became very clear during the pandemic. In the two years of the pandemic, that 15%, those are the red bars that stand out in the graph, because growth was already very small as you heard, just 500 members, and those are members of IPv6 only or ASNs with some other IPv4 resource. Or micro. Whether nano or micro. So the difference is not significant, and even might reduce a 0.5% when we have a 0.7. 
percent. So that is a limited reduction. Well, we have considered uh, people who pay everything in advance, and this was reduced a couple of years ago. In the past, we had 10 percent discount for prompt payment. We decreased that to 5 percent. Initially, it was 10 percent. We managed to have a financial management which made it relevant to count on that money earlier. But at that time, the performance was not so much. So this, the rates have really skyrocketed. So this mechanism is not so relevant. But this is one of the things that we always have on the table to consider that element under certain financial considerations. ¿Alguna pregunta más? So, thank you all for your comments. The dialogue is open in order to reach the best solution that is meaningful for the organization and also for the membership. Thank you. All right, so now let us go over to item number four of the order of business with appointing two members to sign the minutes. I'd like to make the following proposal, Lita Ibarra and Edmundo Casares to sign the minutes of the meeting. Let us vote or we submit this proposal to sign the minutes of the meetings. We'll vote this and we open the vote registration system and because this is a formal voting the voting system will be based for four or five minutes we won't wait for everyone to vote but we'll determine four to five minutes this is not to rush you up but we have the social event shortly appointing Rafael Ibarra and Edmundo Casares to sign the minutes of the meeting. About 92% of the participants have already voted. Just one more minute and we close the voting.
Muy bien, con el 98% of participants have voted. We now close the voting, and these are the results. Against zero, in favor, 493, 73 abstentions, and 56 did not vote. So we approve this motion by majority. We now close the session at 7.08 p.m. Thank you very much for participating. So thank you very much to all the members who participated and to the board who was present. I'd like to please ask you that before you leave the